You're listening to the DolphinsTalk.com Podcast Network. Welcome to Dolphins Talk Weekly, your one-stop audio breakdown of all of this week's Miami Dolphins news. Now, here is your host, Kevin Durr. Host Kevin Dern. Please give me a follow on Twitter at KevinMD4. And you can follow the show on Spotify, iTunes, or wherever else you listen to your podcasts. I hope you all had a Merry Christmas and loved the Dolphins' Christmas Eve victory over the Dallas Cowboys 22 20 this past Sunday. I've been dealing with a little bit of a stomach bug myself after having some sick kiddos the past couple weeks. So, in light of that, no whiskey segment for tonight as I record this on Wednesday uh, during the week. The holiday schedule has kind of got everything a little wonky in the game being on Christmas Eve and all. So I hope you can appreciate the podcast coming out a couple days later. We'll be back on track this Sunday with the recap of the massive contest the Dolphins have against the Baltimore Ravens. Um, I have not gotten to do any prep on the Ravens, so this podcast will strictly be a recap of the game against Dallas, and I will give a couple thoughts on the Ravens game uh, with no real film study having gone into the Ravens at this point of the season. Uh, but to me, the win against Dallas, that was a gut check win. Um, you know, if you've played any sport, if you've ever gone up against a team that, you know, people think is better or they're ranked higher or what have you, to go out there and be able to prove that you can play at that level and win at that level, that's a good gut check game. And the Dolphins passed this one with flying colors in my eyes because it was a different game in game flow than they've really had most of the year. If you go back to the first quarter, you know Dallas starts off with a 15-play drive that ends up in the fumble right at the goal line. You know The Dolphins go back... And they ended up going for it. You know, looked like it was going to be a little bit of a shootout game. They went for it on the, the fourth down play. Looked like it would be a shootout kind of in the first quarter. And then things kind of slowed down. The Dolphins defense kind of took hold of that game. Second quarter, third quarter. And then in the fourth quarter, they needed to come back and go on a game winning drive to let Jason Sanders kick his fifth field goal of the day. So that to me represents a gut check game where you know Miami won and they played better and dominated really three quarters of that game even though they didn't have all the advantages you know Jalen Waddle goes out and going into the game you know we got the news that Rob Hunt was out again Austin Jackson wasn't going to start so four of your five offensive linemen are backups only Teron Armstead was there. McDaniel made another low red zone fade call to Cedric Wilson this time. You know, just a couple things kind of stacked up against the Dolphins early. And you got a game where some of the more unheralded players stepped up. You look at Durham Smythe had five catches for 56 yards during the game. You look at Rob Jones, who was absolutely moving people and made a huge block on the Jeff Wilson third down conversion run at the end of the game right before the Dolphins kneeled it down a couple times to set up the final field goal. Uh, Do yourself a favor and watch what Rob Jones does on that play. Deshaun Elliott made that crazy tackle of Tony Pollard right near the goal line with Zach Sealer, saved his touchdown, and the Dolphins get the ball back the next play. Difference in the game, you look at Braxton Berrios, who made a great block on the screen pass to Tyreek Hill on the final Dolphins drive. Not all of the stars had big moments. You had some more unheralded guys come through and play. And once you get into this late December, January football, the playoffs, it's going to take everybody. And you need guys like that to be able to step up. And I think it's a key thing that the Dolphins were able to get that. Um, We're going to start offensively. Just kind of go through some of my notes. Um, 
more X's and O's stuff this week rather than stats. Um, Miami didn't run the ball super effectively, especially out wide because of Dallas's speed. But they were able to hit a few, a few chunks here and there, especially up the middle with some of the gap scheme stuff with Raheem Mostert and then certainly Jeff Wilson a couple plays on that last drive. Uh, they ran it really physically. Um, again, check out Rob Jones's block on that third down play. Kendall Lamb had a nice block on that play as well. Miami runs the ball well when they have to, and I think if you had had Rob Hunt and Austin Jackson on that right side, you'd be able to move Rob Jones to left guard where he started and played pretty well both this year and last year. So I think that would give you really four of the five spots you'd feel pretty comfortable with. Liam Eichenberg at center is kind of the one you know, red flag position you would have if you had the, the optimal lineup. But because you have to play Lester Cotton, Liam Eichenberg, and Kendall Lamb, I don't think you have all your horses in the run game working and pulling as hard as they could be normally, especially against a front like Dallas, who coming off of a, a, a hugely disappointing performance in Buffalo where they got absolutely gashed on the ground, you know that's going to be a point of emphasis for them. And they held Miami relatively in check, held them under 100 yards rushing. I think Raheem Mostert and Jeff Wilson both had above four yards per carry averages, but Devon Achan they were pretty keyed in on. That being said, there were still some nice moments. Um, Dur- Durham Smythe, Teron Armstead on the left side got you a couple nice runs, especially the Mostert run uh, to start the second half where you got the chunk play. Speaking of Durham Smythe, I mentioned it before, caught five passes for 56 yards. A lot of those were for first downs. And very quietly, not many people would have ever even guessed this, he is third on the team in both catches and yards this year behind Hill and Waddle, who, you know, are both above 70 catches and both above 1,000 yards on the season. You got nice contributions from Cedric Wilson in the game with a couple catches. Braxton Berrios had the nice block. You know, just kind of a, a an interesting performance all around. And I think one of the things that was very cool for me to see especially on that last drive and the drive before the half to set up that final field goal was that Dallas, I think, had some pretty good plans in place from their scouting because they were spot dropping guys to the depths where Tyreek Hill normally runs their routes. You know, I bet Dan Quinn had that charted and they were even using Micah Parsons on some of those drops and trying to pressure with Demarcus Lawrence who... You know, if you want to watch an interesting side battle, obviously they were going to put Micah Parsons all over the place, but mostly against Kendall Lamb. So Demarcus Lawrence got Teron Armstead, who was absolutely phenomenal in this game, save for like one pressure. But you look at what Miami did with Tua, and I, this is one of the the real underrated things I, I appreciate about Tua, and I, I've come to appreciate it more and more as we've seen him in year two of this McDaniel system is they went to a lot of three-step drop or gun shotgun position with no hitch. He's basically just catching and throwing. And they made this point on the broadcast a couple weeks ago where he plays with a, a really wide base. So when he hits that drop or if he gets that ball in the shotgun, he's just basically able to, to set his hands and throw because he's already in position to plant. It was something that Drew Brees did really well in New Orleans for a long time. And, you know, if you remember back when Tua was coming out of Alabama, left-handed Drew Brees was kind of the stylistic comparison that Tua got a lot. We saw that play out on Sunday where basically anything Miami wanted short underneath was there, whether it was Durham Smythe, Cedric Wilson, they used Tyreek Hill, on a lot of these shorter routes because Dallas was basically trying to, especially after the first two throws of the game, which were that deep ball to Hill where there was just a, you know, 
the slight disconnect. I hit his hand, but could it have been placed better? Tua was under a lot of duress on that throw, and then they had the brilliant throw, big boy throw, to Jalen Waddle to get out of the, the shadow of their own end zone, their own goalposts. Dallas was pretty afraid of getting beat over the top, and they play a bunch of cover one, so they're trying to spot drop everything underneath to take away all those in-breaking routes that the Dolphins run so well, in particularly with Hill and Waddle. Mike McDaniel recognized it and said, okay, they're going to spot drop to depth. We'll just go underneath. And to me, going back, this is the answer or one of the answers that came out of the Chargers game last year when Tua was just miserable, like 10 for 21 or whatever he was in the first half and or however it was for the game. Miami had no answers. This was an answer. So to me, it shows that there are more layers to the McDaniel offense. It shows, I think, Tua's maturity level and the ability to kind of adapt his physical skill set of his drop rather than taking a standard three-step or five-and-a-hitch-step drop. He's basically able to kind of shuffle, shuffle, throw. You know, doesn't have to hitch up into it, especially on some of these shorter throws. Um, so that was a very cool aspect out of it. Um, you know, overall, I, I think a lot of people, especially if you read the national media or listen to like the national media pundits, they don't realize how sort of amorphous this offense has been. You know, it's sort of gone from last year where McDaniel was basically just, we're going to hit the same thing over and over and over. We're going to throw to Hill and Waddle on these 15, 20-yard routes right over the middle of the field, and we're going to just spam it to now where we're seeing them, okay, if teams are going to take this away or they're going to take away the middle, how do we attack the flats? How do we attack underneath? How do we still gear up and tack deep down the field, whether it's conventional passing or through play action, there's a lot more answers this team can kind of check to when teams sort of spam that we're not going to give you free reign over the middle of the field. And I think that'll be a key thing this Sunday against Baltimore, just with how variable their defense is and how much it's improved from the, the, the defensive unit we saw last year where Tua hung 42 points and six tutties on him. Um, I think the one area where Baltimore is a little weak is the run game. So if you can get Rob Hunt and Austin Jackson back, you can move Rob Jones over to left guard in place of Lester Cotton. You can kind of bolster your run game and not have to rely so much. And that was kind of a surprise to me was how much McDaniel called in terms of pass plays early in the game, especially in the first half. Felt like Miami was doing pretty well. You had a a few uncharacteristic misses and bad throws from Tua, but you never had the the oh shit throw where like it's almost picked off for a pick six or something like that. You didn't have that. Even in the Jets game, 30 to nothing, you almost had one of those right before half. You know, didn't have that against Dallas. You know, protected the ball very well, then only took one sack, didn't take a bunch of big hits after that first play of the game from Parsons. Just overall, I, despite having to kick three 50 plus yard field goals and sort of as the de facto president of the Jason Sanders will be fine member of the fan base for the last two years. Told you so. Miami managed that game pretty well. The only thing I would question is, is in hindsight, I kind of understand why they went for it in that fourth down situation early against Dallas. Um, but maybe you take that extra field goal there, and that almost ended up biting him in the ass later in the game. So, you know, 
kind of ticky tack there, but I thought Miami managed that game very well. Uh, I thought Hard Knocks kind of led us into some insight and to kind of see their play calling process and kind of the let's just call it what it is the veteran savviness of Tua especially in the play call to to Tyreek on the little Z screen where you know it's one of those old quarterback tricks where if it's a fourth down and short the quarterback always taps all the O-linemen in the helmet then they run a naked or a play action or something like that kind of the same deal here where Tua talks to everybody else directly and looks at them except for Tyreek. And he's talking to everybody else in the huddle, except for Tyreek, even though he's speaking to Tyreek. Kind of a subtle move there. And, you know, Chase Daniel, uh, former veteran backup quarterback who's got his own, I don't know if it's his own channel or has his own content on NFL stuff this year. Very smart guy. Kind of went through and tweeted about that earlier today as well. So cool to see kind of the behind the the scenes of what went into that play call and, and sort of the veteran savviness and maturity from Tua Tunga Vailoa. Um, kind of a cool moment, and especially for the several times this year in big moments where the Dolphins have called screens and they failed. Cool to see one work, and again extra kudos to Braxton Berrios for the block on that play to spring Tyreek back inside up the middle for the first down. Um, Defensively, moving on to this side of the ball, tough assignment for Miami to be without Javon Holland in this game. Um, CeeDee Lamb has a lot of speed. Brandon Cooks a lot of speed. The Tolbert kid, faster than I thought. They still have Michael Gallup. So you had to, as Vic Fangio, you kind of had to protect the deep routes, especially if your pass rush was a little iffy, um, which Miami's wasn't. They they did a really nice job, you know, especially after the first couple drives. Um, I thought Mike McCarthy did a really nice job with his opening script. You know, they got the the 15 play drive to start the game. They had a brilliant call on the fourth down play where they got it. Um, But I think Miami held Dallas to their lowest third down conversion percentage of the year, like 33%. And like Dak Prescott had been like 70% third down conversions over the past couple, two or three games, something crazy like that, especially when he runs. So that's a cool sign. And Miami's third down defense has continued to get better and better and better throughout the year. C.D. Lamb, I know that's kind of a, a hot topic. He had four catches, 93 yards, and a touchdown in the first quarter by himself. Only had two catches for 25 yards the rest of the game. Now people ask, you know, why didn't we have Jalen Ramsey shadow him? I think... Miami may have tried some of that had they had Javon Holland available in the game. He's a much better athlete than Deshaun Elliott and especially Brandon Jones. But when you don't have Holland and you have to play within that structure of the defense, which thrives on those two high safety coverages, so you're playing open middle, it kind of affects how you rotate some of your coverage stuff if you have a Meg call, which is man everywhere he goes, or you want to shadow or you want to shadow CD Lamb with Jalen Ramsey. It seems very much like Ramsey and, and Xavier Howard have sort of settled into right corner, left corner, respectively. Um I think there was a miscommunication on the touchdown. You know, it looked like Cater Kohu tried to signal something to Deshaun Elliott, and they had sort of what looked like a one lurk uh, call on where Elliott kind of broke towards the middle of the field instead of carrying that over route, and it gave C.D. Lamb enough time to make the catch get to full speed, outran Brandon Jones. Elliott, I don't know what he was really trying to do. It looked like he had a the angle to at least kind of knock him out of bounds looked like he tried to play for the football and missed and you end up giving up a touchdown but I think you know and I'll credit 
Chris Kaufman for pointing this out at CK Parrot on Twitter. When you're playing Dallas, you're, you're game planning to stop Dak Prescott, not C.D. Lamb. And let me see. This is the one note. Statistically, I did kind of break down. Yeah, the, the Cowboys receivers give you some trouble with the speed. But Miami forced them into eight completions of eight yards or less. And I think six of those eight were for like six yards or less. So it's a bunch of short throws that they're really kind of between the coverage and the pass rush and all of the games, really, that's a great example of team defense. And you you kind of pinned Dallas into a, a short box. And as long as you're able to protect that middle of the field, you could kind of eliminate what Dak Prescott and CeeDee Lamb did in the first quarter. Um, incredible job of the Dolphins stopping the run with the light boxes, especially against that offensive line. I know Dallas was missing Tyron Smith, um, but I don't think I've ever seen anyone dog walk Zach Martin the way Christian Wilkins did. Um, very interesting by Fangio to have Zach Sealer kind of rotate and play a true zero technique when they stemmed some of the fronts. That was pretty cool to see, especially when they inserted a backer, which was mostly Duke Riley, to kind of give the impression of a blitz and we're going to back off of it. Different than a simulated pressure, just more of a bluff. You held Tony Pollard to 12 carries for 38 yards, you know, barely over three yards a carry. You held Dallas as a team... Had 27 or 24 carries for 75 yards, which is pretty damn good, until Dak broke off that 22-yard scramble on the final drive. Um, but you have to admire the way that the Dolphins' front played, and I think I, I really enjoy. And this is the one part of the the Chicago Bears playbook from Fangio I don't have. It's all of the pass rush games and stunt calls that they have. Miami's made a killing out of the ET and TE stunts. And sometimes, you know, for the older fans, I know this isn't what it's going to be called in the Fangio terminology, but if you remember the steel curtain defense the Steelers had of the 70s where they basically played a stunting 4-3 and they called it the Tom game, where you looped an end around both defensive tackles from the backside to the front side uh, B or C gap, depending on the, the tight end alignment. Miami's done some of that, especially with Bradley Chubb lately. And I think they did a great job of forcing Dak Prescott to go to his left. You notice a lot of those sacks, the one where Sealer got him, He's going to his left. There was the one where, you know, I think Sealer almost got him, and then David Long and Van Ginkle pulled him down, rolling to his left. You look at the the ridiculous roughing the passer call on Christian Wilkins. Look at what they do. They stem the front. They have Sealer rush directly over the center, Biotish, and you have Wilkins directly over Martin as a three technique. They're basically crashing from that angle to try and force Dak Prescott to the left into Bradley Chubb. A brilliant, brilliant game plan from the front four for Miami. Um, That being said, Melvin Ingram looks a little out of shape. They need to figure out kind of a, a third guy, whether that's getting Emmanuel Ogba kind of up and running again, whether that's Cameron Good, whether it's Ingram... You would love to see what this front would be doing with Jalen Phillips still active and playing. But the way that Fangio called it, it was total team defensive effort. You know, I thought David Long probably had his best game in terms of coverage and dropping um, that he's had as a Dolphin. You know, he's been brilliant against the run all season, but in terms of coverage, I thought that was his best game. I liked the fact that Fangio mixed in some of the dime stuff with Nick Needham. Um, got burned by it on Dallas's final drive a couple times where Needham couldn't stay with C.D. Lamb. And I think that's just kind of one of the things where 
such a staple of Fangio's defense philosophically. You're going to get some some favorable matchups if you're an opponent and you have an elite receiver like that who can play out of the slot, especially when you can get him up against Nick Needham versus Cater Kohu. Um, but yeah, like four sacks, hammering Tony Pollard, holding him under 40 yards. And just on the sacks, Chubb and Van Ginkle both had one and a half. Sealer had one by himself. Um, the front four has played really, really well. And again, we'll, we'll tip this back to Chris Kaufman at CK Parrot on Twitter. Made the point that at least defensively, this team is going to kind of go as that front goes. And once again, I will metaphorically bang the table since I've got sleeping children. They need to do whatever they can to keep Christian Wilkins in the fold. Um, He's just such a phenomenal player, such a great leader, and he and Zach Sealer are able to play off of each other so well. I think you'd be doing a lot more harm than good by letting him walk. Uh, or franchise tagging him and exposing him to the market. Pay him what you need to to keep this front intact. And I know everyone's going to say, well, let's pay Andrew Van Ginkle. You can find another Andrew Van Ginkle. I think it's a little harder to find another Christian Wilkins who can kind of seamlessly go from zero out to a five technique and give you that level of play. Plus, you have Jalen Phillips coming back. Neither here nor there for right now, I guess, for the offseason conversation. But this is me stumping to extend Christian Wilkins. Um, And don't look now. I know there's that graphic that ESPN ran today on NFL Live about since like week eight, the Dolphins are first in total defense, first in points per game, like third in completion percentage. All these great numbers since Jalen Ramsey's return. On the season now, Miami's total defense is fourth. Fifth in Rundy. Tenth against the pass. You're 13th in points allowed. And again, we do this every week. You take away those 47 points that are attributable to offense and special teams gaffes. All else being equal across the NFL, Miami would be tied for third in points allowed at 17.8 per game instead of, I think they're at like 20 or something like that right now, points per game allowed. Tremendously impressive victory because it wasn't the type of victory we were accustomed to the Dolphins seeing. This game reminded me a little bit of the Chiefs game from earlier in the year, and Miami came up small in those moments, and that kind of derailed them. Miami came up small a couple times. They had some drives stall out. Tua had some uncharacteristically bad throws that end drives. But you got Jason Sanders to hit three 50-yard field goals. The team kept adding points. You didn't have any dumb penalties, or at least that were actually penalties. You know, the Wilkins one was bullshit, I guess, to the counter. The one on Micah Parsons was bullshit as well, and the Dolphins got a touchdown off that drive. But you didn't have that major mistake. You didn't have a costly fumble. You didn't have a pre-snap penalty. You didn't have a dumb turnover. You didn't have a stupid personal foul for taking your helmet off. They prove they can do it. And I think the, the next challenge is, is can you take down, let's just call it what it is record-wise, the best team in the NFL on the road. We just saw what Baltimore did in San Francisco. You get to go into Baltimore with the Ravens on a short week. I think my message for the team, if I'm Mike McDaniel, is don't get caught up in the headlines. You look at, we'll just say, the two most complete performances this team has had this year. The 70-20 to game against Denver back in week three. And then the 45-15 to game against the Commanders a couple weeks ago. Big-time victories. You win by 50 points. You win by 30 points. 
lost the game the next week both times. You got crushed by Buffalo 48-20 to in week four, and you lost in embarrassing fashion to Tennessee at home on that Monday night game 28-27 after the, the commanders win. Don't be complacent. I think Miami, I would use this analogy, especially offensively, they've kind of gone from being just the Ferrari or the Lamborghini from last year to where now they're kind of like a Jeep. They're a little bit more physical. They're more rugged. They can adapt much better to various game plans. Like We've seen it all season from week two where Belichick was spamming the three safety stuff. We've seen it, you know, against... Kansas City where they kind of adapted through the middle of the game against Spagnuolo's blitz package and the two-man stuff. We saw it against Dallas on Sunday where Dallas had basically charted out all of the in-break routes and the spot dropping to that. Don't let this environment on Sunday be too big. And to Mike McDaniel's point, that Tennessee loss looms really large right now. Because if you had picked that up, you'd be even with Baltimore, ahead on a tiebreaker, and if you win Sunday, you clinch home field advantage instead of just the division. But that's still a huge prize to play for. You clinch the division Sunday, you guarantee yourself a home playoff game, and you get the chance to, if you win out, get the number one seed. Home field advantage throughout the playoffs. That's the big prize. Especially, as I mentioned on the last episode, if the Dolphins can avoid having to play on my birthday, and if you know what it is, you know the awful history behind it, that makes everything much better. (laughs) And it allows me to enjoy my birthday for, for once when the Dolphins are actually still in the hunt of the playoffs or thick of the playoff race. That's going to do it for this show. Again, thank you guys for tuning in. Follow me on Twitter at KevinMD4. We'll be back recording this Sunday night, recapping the massive game in the Charm City this weekend. Uh, Hope everyone has a safe, happy, and healthy New Year. And fins up.